All right, we are moving on to part seven in project management where we're thinking about risk management within projects. And I know that you have other courses where you're spending a lot of time on food safety risk management. And risk management is much more diverse than just food safety within food organizations. And so I want to take some time to think through the different implications. We can't necessarily solve every scenario, but I want you to be extremely aware of what the potential scenarios could be so that you can start to think with a problem solving mindset in place so that you're going to manage those risks effectively. So at the end of this video, you will be able to evaluate food safety risk within an organization. And I realize those of you who are at Niagara College are taking uh, course after course after course on food safety management. So we're just going to quickly gloss over it but I want to make sure that I'm not forgetting it as part of this. We we're going to talk about organizational management risks within the food organization. So things like human resources and um, how the organization itself can become a risk to the organization. We're going to talk about potential environmental risks, potential fraud and bioterrorism risks, and also financial and reputational risks to the organization. So risk management is something that should be done consistently throughout planning, implementation, and production. And it's a continuous process. Just because you think that you have evaluated those risks and mitigated those risks at any given time, you do need to go back in and reevaluate because risk is a continuously evolving scenario. And there's so many different um, ways that risk can interfere with projects or interfere with operations. Right now, we're all living through the COVID pandemic. And honestly, from a risk planning perspective, this is such a great case study of how organizations have been either dealing extremely well with risk or not dealing so well. So how do we define risk? Well, there's a few different definitions that float around. Um, one that I very commonly like to use is from Peter Sandman, and he uses the framework of risk is hazard times probability or hazard times outrage is something that he also uses quite frequently in his writings. Risk is something that you need to uh, think about from a probability perspective. How often is this going to occur? And there are entire courses where you spend time in air. Yeah, more often from an insurance or actuarial perspective, where you think about how frequent certain scenarios are going to happen. The other piece of the puzzle is that um, level of impact. And so is it going to be something that's a minor disruption and you just carry on with a little bit of difficulty? Or is it going to be something that is perilous to an organization's success and potentially could bankrupt the organization or um, stall its entire operations. Oftentimes you hear a second definition of risk. Risk is the probability times the financial impact. And this is very operationally specific, but there's a, there's a really strong basis behind that. If you are a business and you are the manager of that business, the success of your business is really based off of the finances and the ability of that business to keep the doors open and keep product flowing out. And that's a financial aspect. So you need to think about it from a probability times the financial impact. So again, is this something where you're going to lose a few hundred dollars and you could absorb that impact? Or is it going to bankrupt the company and, and uh, completely gut out the operations? We've talked ad nauseum about food safety risk management. We have entire courses on HACCP. We have courses on process validation. You are uh, if you're at Niagara College, you are most likely GFSI certified with SQF. And you have done all sorts of different scenarios about traceability and so on. I do not want to rehash that, but food safety risk management is one of the primary risks that need to be managed. In a different uh, slideshow at a later point, we'll talk about how risk management interplays with insurance policies within companies. But you need to 
show that you have a due diligence approach to risk, and food safety is the most common one that we as food scientists interplay with. Insurance is absolutely critical for any food manufacturing operation, both from a liability perspective. If you want to go and sell your product, you need to show that you have liability insurance if for some reason your product were to impact the health and well-being of another person or organization, that you have liability insurance against that. Food safety risk also allows for the insurance policies for operations to be covered in that you know that um, there's going to be continuity on your organization and that there's not going to be any um, damages to the workforce, the shareholders, etc. So food safety risk as food scientists is the one that we spend the most time on, but I really want you to be aware that there's other types of risk that are uh, foundationally involved in food operations. One of them is organizational risk, and this is where we're looking at, in many cases, the human resources challenges behind food operations. Um, the photo that I've got attached in here came from an, uh, a newspaper, and one organizational risk that is not uncommon in food uh, facilities is the potential of labor and union activity strikes. I am a big advocate for uh, unionized labor because it's a way that workforce has stability and that stability allows for continuity in the workforce. But if you are in a scenario where you know that there's going to be contract negotiations coming up and the potential of those contracts to break down, that is where you could see an organizational risk where the continuity of being able to get your product out is limited because you don't have a workforce. They're out on strike. Unionized labor has a, has a strong benefit in that they are able to go and negotiate on behalf of, of the people and the welfare of those workers. In other organizations, they say, you know what, we don't want to have unions because it allows us to go in and negotiate with people one-on-one. -on -one. And there's a point to that. Um, however, historically, unions have done a lot of good in terms of maintaining the stability of um, the blue collar workforce. There are other potential um, scenarios that could be completely outside of unionized labor. In certain countries, there are political disruptions. Um, uh, for example, in France, there are often general strikes where the entire workforce just walks out and demands different things of the government. These are potential scenarios that could be um, impacting on the operations of your food manufacturing. There could be other broader trade issues. So for example, it may be not your facility, but it could be someone in your supply chain. Or if you are importing product from another country that is having a trade issue or a labor issue, that can trickle down back to your organization. I see I just jumped over occupational health and safety, but not having safe workplaces can also become an issue. And we'll have a different slide deck on uh, workplace safety and um, making sure that you're treating the workforce properly. But this has not been uncommon in Ontario, Canada, where we are located, where individuals are injured or killed in the workforce and the decisions made by managers impacting on that based off of their oversight for occupational health and safety, the delivery of training, the in insurance of um, appropriate safeguards within the workplace and so on. These can be major challenges for the continuity of your organization. You can also have issues related to pandemic and disease outbreak. Right now, one of the biggest organizational risks within uh, food operations is continuity of the workforce related to COVID-19 in that if one person in the facility is impacted by COVID-19 and then the, the facility has to shut down more or less and go through deep sanitation and that can put off critical chain in terms of delivery on certain products at certain due dates in perishable goods cold chain or um, the production of short shelf life food products, it can really have a major financial impact if you start to have backlog of product. If you are also seeing um, perhaps not a direct outbreak, but let's say, for example, you have a workforce that is in a community that is seeing other broad outbreaks, you may have policies in place where 
if your um, workforce has uh, direct contact with someone who has COVID-19, they may be required to be off the job and therefore you are short staffed. These sorts of scenarios are currently in play in many food companies and it's it's causing organizations to have to reevaluate their overtime policies and their use of temporary workers. These are real things that need to be considered within the sustainability of organizations. How about reputational risk? I'm sure you've heard about times where companies, food companies have put out a product and someone starts to complain online and it snowballs into all sorts of negative publicity. This can impact negatively on your sales and that Sales indicates your cash flow and cash flow indicates your profitability and your ability to keep the doors and the lights open and make your payroll. So making sure that you are aware of your online reputation and your reputation within the media is extremely critical. Do you have a tactical plan if someone comes in and starts complaining about you and loudmouthing and, and bashing your company? Do you have a strategic plan to mitigate that as fast as possible so that your product and your, your organization stays in the positive light and consumers are happy to buy your product? Another one is environmental risks. So perhaps it's floods, ice, earthquakes, storms, hurricanes, etc. We live in Canada and the possibility of having any number of different environmental um, disasters occurring is not uncommon. Uh, right now it's the fall season in, in, in Canada and much of the East Coast has the potential of having hurricane activity occurring. If you are in certain areas, flooding or ice storms are distinct possibilities. In other locations, earthquakes are possible. But uh, environmental uh, risk could also include uh, secondary aspects such as utilities disruption. Maybe you have a large freezer plant and if the electricity were to be shut off at your freezer plant, what would happen to all the product that's within that storage area? Do you have a plan in place so that you can maintain the quality of that product? What are th uh, uh, Another one is the neighboring industrial infrastructure. Are you next to facilities that if they were to have an incident would impact on your facility and your product? Another one would be structural damage to your physical premises. If for some reason there were to be damage, let's say a truck drove into the wall of your building or there was a fire, what would happen to the entire building? Would you be able to maintain your inventory? Would you be able to uh, mitigate the impact to the product that's within there and therefore mitigate, mitigate costs? Would you be able to have continuity on your operations? One of, the, one of the neatest experiences that I had when I was working for the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, I was at a plant and there was a major blackout that occurred and watching the tactics of that organization to quickly go in and apply all of the different electrical generators that they had um, within their facility to be able to maintain the product. They also transferred um, excess product that was in progress into... Uh, refrigerator trucks or reefer trucks, the product that was uh, in process on the cook step, it did have to get um, monitored from a time and temperature perspective, but the organization did a really fantastic job at being able to quickly mobilize and um, be able to manage that risk to the organization and the, all of the, the costs of, of uh, work in progress to make sure that the, the, the costs the potential losses during that time were going to be minimized. Why were they able to be successful? They had a written plan. They had a written plan where they had done tabletop exercises anticipating that the potential of an electrical, um, an electrical outage within their facility would be reasonably high. Remember, frequency and impact. What would be the hazard and what would be the impact? Well, they knew that the frequency was going to be Extremely, uh, extremely likely, given that in southern Ontario, the likelihood of thunderstorms and ice storms is pretty high. So they knew that electrical outages were going to be quite likely, and therefore they had installed generators for backup onto their refrigeration units. 
How about food fraud and bioterrorism? This is where you have intentional um, mitigate or intentional adulteration of your product, whether that's through organizational level fraud or whether that's through sole uh, single actors. I put up this uh, photo because it was about uh, 12 years ago. It was 2008, actually, that in China there was a major food fraud incident where a, um, a powdered milk company was adulterating the milk with melamine. Melamine is a nitrogen-containing compound, and those of you who remember from our uh, food chemistry class that protein is often measured by measuring the total nitrogen within the product. And so by putting melamine into the milk, they knew that the milk protein content would be evaluated by total nitrogen, and it inflated the numbers artificially. However, melamine is, a, is toxic and it can cause kidney failure. And the challenge is this powdered milk was put into baby formula. And so quite a number of babies died in this incident. Many other babies experienced kidney failure and were on dialysis. And um, the management that was implicated in this was actually um, subject to capital punishment. So they were executed by the Chinese state. Um, so thinking about food fraud and bioterrorism, you have to think within your organizational structure, do you have a management-based commitment to food safety and to um, minimize food fraud and adulteration within your food products? Oftentimes it's not the, it's not the employees that are out there doing food fraud, it's from the top down at the uh, management and executive levels where people want to uh, cut costs and increase profitability. In other cases, it could be bioterrorism, where you have lone actors coming in and adulterating product. Uh, there was an uh, incident not that long ago in the United States where an employee was found um, licking ice cream <laughs> before sealing the product. And that just sounds horrible, but there have been other incidents where employees have inserted um, needles or pieces of metal into product uh, with intent. And so having good human resources policies to make sure that there is a really strong uh, fact-checking behind the hiring of any employee to make sure that they have good references and a, a good, good reputation before coming into the organization. The other piece of the puzzle is having really good operating procedures so that you know exactly what should be going on, and then having good supervision and monitoring and verification procedures as part of those operating procedures to make sure that there's always a second set of eyes checking on product to make sure that the product is exactly as it says it should be. How about innovation risk? This is another one. Um, so much of the food innovation space is a copycat marketplace where you will have one market leader going out and they will develop a new brand and a new concept. And then all of the other companies within short order will come in with a me too type product. It's really important to maintain that branding and maintain that market edge. In some cases, companies will do trademark and intellectual property management. And we do have another slideshow based off of that topic. What can food companies do to manage their intellectual property? In, in certain cases, you have to be able to go out and execute against the intellectual property agreements that you have. And so many small companies will say, well, I'd like to get a patent. I'd like to do this. I'd like to, do, uh, I'd like to have a trademark and so on. But it's only as good as your ability to go and enforce it. And so you have to be out there scanning the environment to know here is what I have under trademark or under patent or under some form of trade secret. I now see that this competitor is infringing on my intellectual property. How can we go and prosecute it? That prosecution piece is absolutely critical. The other piece of the puzzle is management of contracts. And so, so often I, I've had the chance to work with small companies working with co-packers and they'll go in and they'll say, oh, you know what? I don't need a lawyer involved. I don't need a contract. I'm just going to go in and make an agreement, shake hands, sign off and so on. And I've seen this happen where companies hand off intellectual property to a co-packer and then the co-packer twists and turns that intellectual property and says it's their intellectual property. 
and therefore they have the right to make that product and are competing against the small business and in some cases squeezing that small business out of out of operation. We have another slideshow completely on co-packing agreements and the importance of setting in place written contracts about who owns the intellectual property because again in the case of innovation risk the intellectual property is only as good as your ability to enforce against it and if you have nothing written in place if you have no foundational contract and just a, a, a spoken word agreement it's very very difficult to go against whereas if you have a written contract you can go and enforce against that and in many cases, you can then control the outcome of your product and maintain your innovation advantage. Financial risks. This is not a finance course and I'm not a financial guru, but this is another risk that you really need to be aware of. And I, I can't stress this enough to my students that watching the news, reading the newspapers and keeping your ear to the ground about the different um, global scenarios that are going on are really, really important when there are um, economic downturns in the marketplace, whether those are financial stock crashes or whether they are long-term um, downgrading of the confidence of the market, that can have really strong impact on companies' ability to innovate. Companies need to be profitable to be able to go out and bring out new products and to maintain their standing. And if you are noticing that your company and the organization that you're with is struggling financially, that can have a lot of implication on um, the innovation cycles that are occurring within that company. Some of it could be internal and it could just be based off of how the finances are being managed within the company. And in other cases, they can be external. So if you have um, a lot of the stability of the income in your company based off of the stock market and share price, if there's a massive um, market correction, such as we've seen during the COVID pandemic, or what we saw in 2008 with the Lehman Brothers recession, that can, in, uh, that can influence the company's ability to go and make investments in um, physical plant or in new technologies or come up with new ideas. Honestly, do pay attention to the finances of your company that you're working in to be able to keep your head above water and to know when it's time to double down and work even harder and when it's time to potentially even leave the company. Do make sure from a forecasting perspective, there are times that you can pay attention and stay ahead of risk. So for example, following global and regional news is really, really critical. You want to connect with your supply chain providers and connect with sales and distribution to know what's going on. Are there going to be any labor disruptions? Are there any uh, storms anticipated? Are there um, any sorts of disruptions that are going to potentially come your way? This is a, uh, my take home message is diversify. Do make sure to diversify, not just your supply chain, also diversify your sales channels. I have seen it happen before where companies have put all of their investment into a singular uh, sales channel. So for example, I've seen this before where a company says our primary sales channel is going to be Costco and Costco, as you know, is a fickle, fickle marketplace and they love to increase diversity for their customer base. And so oftentimes they will flip the products around. If you have just invested in Costco and you have invested heavily in one singular product and Costco decides to drop your product, well, you may be out of luck and you if you especially have a short shelf life product and suddenly Costco is terminating your contract and you are sitting on a whole pile of product that needs to be turned over to maintain profitability, you may be out of luck. I have seen it happen before where companies have lost contracts with retailers and they have then gone into financial difficulty. Do make sure to go about doing pre-approval on suppliers just in case your supply chain gets disrupted. We saw this happen with COVID where um, companies had set supply chain contracts with one singular company and had locked in defined pricing on that product. And then suddenly that plant was shut down. The supply plant was shut down for COVID and suddenly there's no supply chain. In the case of one company that I uh, had some nice conversations with, 
they had anticipated COVID. They had seen it happening and they had started to pre-approve other suppliers and were able to have continuity on their supply chain. Whereas another company that I was dealing with had not done the same and they were struggling then to meet their contract obligations to their retailer. Do be aware of the importance of diversification as part of your risk management strategy. From a tactical perspective, you should have a communications plan. This is not going to be the slideshow where we talk about that communications plan, but based off of all of the different risks that are out there, you want to go through some sort of table topping exercise. Table topping just, if you think about the those war room exercises where they had little tiny people walking around maps. Table topping just implies that you've gone through and brainstormed all of the different risk scenarios and you have gone through and built out a tactical plan with a communications plan, org charts. You're going to map out who needs to be engaged in this entire process and find out where, where those touch points are to make sure that there's going to be continuity in that process. I realize this is a whirlwind on risk management. Uh, this could be an entire course. I have taught this course at Ryerson University in the past. Um, it could be an entire course just to talk about how do you communicate risk? How do you develop these work charts and so on? This is like a 20 minute video. Do ask more questions. If there's ever a video that you think would be useful to you, just reach out to me. I'd love to make these videos. I try and make uh, a good number of them every single week right now. Let me know what topics are interesting because I want to make sure that everything that we're doing here is absolutely relevant to the success of you as a person and the success of the organizations that you're working for. All right, take care and have fun.